Now we'd like to give the floor to Paul John Lewenthal, who is attorney of the Legal Services of the European Commission. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Paul John Lewenthal. I'm a member of the Legal Service of the European Commission. Uh, at the Legal Service, uh, I work in the State Aid team, there are about 12 of us, and I am uh, responsible for the past uh, four years on fiscal state aid matters. Uh, which basically means that uh, the cases that have been discussed till now, I have been working on them for the past four years. I, uh, I know them inside and out. I will not comment too much in detail uh, since this is all ongoing litigation in which I am uh, representing the European Commission. But I've been asked more to look into uh, the notion of state aid and how fiscal state aid fits into the basic notion of state aid uh, in relation to recent case law and decisions that we have recently taken. Now, I was very happy to hear before my presentation that fiscal state aid is legitimate. So we're legitimate in looking at fiscal state aid, because otherwise I would be out of job. On um, that point, I just want to highlight um, a judgment that I always like. It's a judgment from 1973 by the Court of Justice uh, dealing with uh, cases Italy versus Commission, where Italy had given tax breaks to its manufacturing sector. And the Commission deemed that to be state aid. And Italy argued, no, we have fiscal sovereignty. We are able to determine our tax policies and how we want to benefit different sectors of the economy. And the court said, no, this is the same as just granting a subsidy. It's a subsidy in another form. So since fiscal state aid is cer certainly legitimate. Now, taking that how, how our recent cases and other cases fit into the notion of state aid, uh, the question I heard very often today is, does it stretch the state aid rules? And like Professor Smith, I will jump to my conclusion, no, it does not. <laughs> and here's the reason why. So, Article 1071, we know it. Uh, I've broken down here the four conditions for finding of state aid. Uh, as regards to fiscal state aid cases, I know there was some mention of distortion of competition, it being, let's say, too easy to show a potential distortion of competition. On that, let's remember that fiscal state aid is basically, I would say, in almost all circumstances, operating aid. Simply operating aid. And the court has said operating aid is not compatible. It is obviously distortive. There's basically a presumption of distortion of competition and the effect on inter-EU trade when we have operating aid. I will focus mostly on the condition of selectivity and advantage, which I refer to here as selective advantage, and the court does as well. As a matter of fact, if we look at the case law of the courts up until, I think it's actually just the World Duty Free Judgment. I think it was one judgment before that, when the court set out the four conditions for finding state aid. And in that list, we did not see the word selective. It just said there must be a measure that's imputable, there must be a distortion of competition, effect on trade, and an advantage. And then, of course, selectivity is a condition for finding state aid, all of a sudden appears, and a selective event. So what is a selective advantage? Now, um, the Moll judgment says rightly that a distinction should be made between selectivity and advantage. Now, the uh, US white paper, which was referred to before, took this to mean that when you assess uh, selectivity and advantage, you must assess them in a decision completely separately from one another. Now, let's first see what these two notions actually mean. Now, advantage mentioned here is that your net financial position has been improved by measure. Selectivity means it has been improved as compared to comparable undertakings. So undertakings in a comparable factual and legal situation. And the reason why we make this distinction is just to stress that not all advantageous measures lead to state aid. I think it's obvious. If you have a general exemption, general tax exemption applying across the board to all companies in a comparable situation, you don't have state aid. You have an advantage, you don't have state aid. Now, the last point I made comes back to the first point. When we think about the three-step selectivity analysis, which I will get to in a second, where what's asked of us is to look, what is the reference framework? It's the first one. What is the benchmark against, we, against what we determine that there is selectivity? And the second step is to ask, has there been derogation from that benchmark? Now, let's think about that very, very precisely. Let's say we have a provision, you know, a provision that basically is saying to us, this is the manner in which a 
company should be taxed in that situation. And then we already have a derogation saying you are not that you get a tax exemption under these rules. Isn't that tax exemption in the end the granting of the net financial position of so improving the net financial position? It's the tax exemption. And is it also the derogation from that rule? And what I mean to say by this is ultimately isn't that test the same? Isn't it actually artificial to break this apart in fiscal state aid cases? What I mean by that, if we go later on to the let's just take an argument of what a lot of the member states are saying in the in the in the state aid cases, is they're saying the benchmark you need to apply is our arms length principle rule in our national legislation. And then you need to determine whether we derogate it from that rule. And what does that rule say? That rule says you must tr price transactions at arm length. If you don't price transactions at arm length, you grant an advantage through reduction of the tax base. So the derogation and the advantage are the same. Now, I ran a little bit ahead of myself, but the first main question here, of course, is in these cases, how do we establish selectivity? And here, uh, the big distinction that the case law has made and emphasized over and over again in many recent cases, I think of the Mole Judgment here, the orange one I mentioned, uh, the Belgian uh, BSE test case, uh, I think World Duty Free also stresses it at the outset is the distinction is made between individual aid measures and general aid schemes. We have an individual aid measure. If we can show an advantage, then selectivity is presumed. The presumption is not an irrebuttable presumption, but the idea is if you grant it only to one entity, one taxpayer, an advantage, then obviously you have selectively favored them compared to other taxpayers. And when it comes to general aid schemes, we have what was devised, I think, possibly uh, for the first time with the pink graphics judgment way back in 2008, the, the three-step test. And that basically requires you to follow these three steps, which is first identification of the reference system, the, let's say the benchmark, the, the normal taxation system, the normal tax regime, then showing that there's a derogation from that reference system, there's an exception has been made. If you can show the first two steps have been fulfilled, you have what's known as a prima facie selective <coughs> And then seeing whether or not that derogation can be justified, again, by the nature and logic of the reference system. Now, I mentioned here, this is a point that was made recently in the, uh, in the airport Lubeck uh, judgment, that the three-step test also applies to non-fiscal state aid measures. Um, that wasn't clear before the judgments. I think that's wrong. Um, I think it's wrong for two reasons, which I mentioned here. First of all, Lubeck, a bit of the background of Lubeck, it was about the airport charges that uh, airport Lubeck was setting, uh, the landing rights and landing fees. And the commission had deemed that to be uh, a selected advantage granted to airlines that landed at Lubeck Airport. The court disagreed with the commission, basically pointing very strongly to the fact that under German legislation, the airports had their own autonomy, that they were separate from other airports. And therefore, what we had to do was to see whether specific airlines, specific operators, undertakings at Airport Lubeck, were being discriminated vis-a-vis -vis other ones. And the fact that Airport Lubeck had better charges than, let's say, the airport of Berlin is not a selective advantage. To me, that's really much more a question of regional selective. And the question you have to ask if you read that judgment is, this works in Germany, a very large member state, but what if it was an airport in Luxembourg? And what if Luxembourg was the one determining, the member state itself was determining the landing fees for different airports? What if, as in Spain, there's one entity determining the landing fees for all airports? Does the same reasoning apply? And now we have a, a very recent judgment, going back on this three-step test here, and how I find it a bit problematic is the Retigal judgment, which deals with the, um, the, the digital uh, terrestrial television uh, saga that happened first before the general court and then uh, at the Court of Justice. The Court of Justice uh, upheld the commission decision saying that there had been a selective advantage granted to uh, providers of um, broad, broadband television, to digital television, vis-a-vis -vis satellite television. Uh, the court just upheld that, but in one of the judgments, in the Retegal judgment, the court annulled the decision for saying that the commission had not properly shown that these companies were in a comparable factual and legal situation. And most importantly, they said you cannot say in a 
non fiscal aid patient cannot say that the selectivity condition is automatically satisfied if the measure applies exclusively to a specific sector or a specific region. And that is contrary, I think, to a lot of the case law that came before it, because, like I just said all the way at the beginning, Italy adopts a measure that is selective only for its manufacturing industry, against which benchmark is that supposed to be compared to? All sectors, all industries, do we need to set up a reference system saying, well, the manufacturing industries are in a comparable situation to all industries, and therefore here, where you get a subsidy, or you get, you get an exemption, there's all of a sudden some kind of selective treatment? I find it a bit confusing. Um, so I want to move on back to uh, fiscal state aid. And for fiscal state aid, uh, I think a very important case that came up recently is the world of free judgments, which basically dealt with the Spanish measure that allowed um, <coughs> undertakings that had made transactions in foreign undertakings to make deductions to the goodwill that they had uh, acquired there. Uh, that was found by the Commission to be a selective measure because domestic undertakings, uh, so, sorry, domestic transactions, undertakings that had made uh, same kind of acquisitions in domestic undertakings could not benefit from that same deduction. Now, the uh, general courts uh, annulled the commission decision, finding that there was no selective treatment there because the commission had not set out a specific category of undertakings that benefited from that measure. Uh, the commission appealed, and the court of justice upheld the, or annulled the uh, judgment of the general court and basically upheld the commission decision for now and sent back to the general court. But what's very useful from that judgment is the first point I put here, and that is where you see the courts perhaps shifting a bit in its logic, its internal market logic of what matters for selectivity is discrimination. Discrimination of comparable situations. That's what it's about. It's, we, we often talk, you know, you have the references and then you have the delegation, but what they're saying is it really comes down to the first two steps is about discrimination. And then, to put it back into what all the case law says before, a derogation from the reference system constitutes a discrimination. Is that correct? I don't know, but that's, it's really all the effort is going back to discrimination. And here is basically the point that uh, the court had kind of said, look, any undertaking can engage in this transaction. Anyone can make a foreign acquisition. So how can this be selected? And they said the fact that any undertaking can engage in that does not mean that it cannot be selected for that reason alone. <coughs> so, I set out the three-step test, but honestly, when you think about it, this is really a three-step test or a two-step test. And I think uh, there's a very good opinion by Advocate General Bobek uh, in the Belgian BSE uh, test case, it's uh, case C27015, where he says, actually, it doesn't matter, it's the same thing. And perhaps, academically, it's more sound to really speak of a two-step test and not a three-step test. The first step being, is there discrimination between comparable undertakings? And how do we determine they're comparable, which we'll get to, but how do we get to that comparability? First of all, is there discrimination between comparable undertakings as determined by the objects, uh, objectives of the legal system, the reference frame in order, under, which, under which that measure is granted? If there is, it's prima facie selective. And the second step, is that discrimination justified? Now, the burden of proof, I point out here, the commission must show the first step, the first two steps from the last uh, three-step test. Whereas the member state has to show that it's justified. The commission can show there's discrimination. Now, um, on the identification of the reference system, uh, I think the statement was already made, so the first step, that the case law is very sparse on this. And I know because for the past four years I've been looking at it in detail, and there really is very, very little said about it. Um, I take somewhat uh, offense to uh, Advocate General Ball's uh, comment that when asked at the hearing uh, how we had defended, identified the reference system, we had no answer because Richard Lyle, who, if anyone should have an answer, spoke 15 minutes on that. So we were very surprised to read that in his opinion. But basically, there is very, very little case law on this. And ironically enough, I think the best case that we have for this is the Gibraltar judgment. And the Gibraltar judgment, funnily enough, does not apply to three step tests, or gives you the impression that when you have a tax system that is designed in a discriminatory way, there the general, let's say, the, 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 the Gibraltarian corporate income tax was designed in a way that offshore companies would not be taxed at all, because they just didn't have these taxable events and tax bases they need to be taxed, whereas onshore companies would. And I think what we can see in that judgment is that determining, basically when we come to the first step, maybe it's, it's not so good to find, let's say, the normative rule, but to find out who is in a comparative and factual legal situation when we look at the objective of the measure that we're looking at and the framework of which it forms a larger part. 
So what was said in the Gibraltar judgment, again, is that determining which underpayments are in a comparable factual legal situation is key to defining the reference system. You need to know who is comparable to say, okay, what is the, the overarching principle that should apply to them all? And here the, the, the court says, you know, we're going to actually ignore what Gibraltar did, because Gibraltar created a obviously discriminatory tax system to ensure that offshore companies are not taxed and onshore are taxed. And we're going to look at what the objective is of a system like that. Well, their objective was to introduce a general system of taxation for all companies in Gibraltar, all of them, not just the onshore ones, the offshore ones too. And then they pointed out, of course, it's not a random consequence that the offshores are not taxed, that was deliberately done in that situation. Now again, when it comes to, uh, sorry, when it comes to determining the, uh, the reference system, the case law also is extremely contradictory on this point. Because when they speak about comparability, we have a number of judgments that say, I would say the vast majority, that say that what matters to determine whether underpayments are comparable is the objectives of the reference system. Now, we'll explain also why it's a bit circular, but it is. But still, that is what we look at, the, at the objectives of the reference system to determine whether they're comparable. We have other cases, and I mentioned here the Adria Bean one, which I think was mentioned uh, earlier this, uh, this morning, um, on the energy charges and the, um, the Inuix case uh, here in the Netherlands, where the courts are referring to the objective of the measure. Now, the problem of looking at the objective of the measure is, if a member state adopts a tax exemption for multinationals, and it says, well, the objective of that measure is to not tax multinationals, therefore, only multinationals are a comparable, par comparable factual and legal situation, no selectivity. No city, very easy. So it can't be that. And that's why I said, could it be both in there? Because it can also not just be the reference system. That's exactly what we're trying to figure out. So how can we determine what the objectives of the reference system are if we don't know what the reference system is? So I would say in cases like this, if I give an example now of the tax rulings, what are we looking What is the objective of a tax ruling? The objective of a tax ruling is to determine the taxable profit of a company that belongs to a multinational group taxable profit for which purpose is to tax it under the general corporate income tax system. That is the larger framework of which that ruling forms a part. Who is in a comparable factual legal situation as regards that larger framework of all undertakings generating profit in the member state in question? And I refer here to the Russian doll. Now, I, I thought it was very admirable that you explained the, the, the German Sineron's causal case because uh, it's so incredibly confusing, but I will just refer to the Russian doll is, is from this opinion I mentioned from Advocate General Bobek, saying when you're looking for that reference system, you're, you can just be you know, basically opening a Russian doll. And what I think we get from the senior spousal cases, you shouldn't take the largest, most broad reference system you can find. You need to go to the lowest level of genera generality. You have to ask yourself, what is the objective of this measure that we are investigating? And what is the lowest level of generality that we're looking at? So here, for instance, this lost charge forward rules, the exception to that, and then the exception to the exception. The exception to the exception is what we're looking at. Then we look at it, the purpose of that within the framework of the exception. And we don't have to go all the way up to the German corporate income tax code system. Now, on um, what cases like World to be Free and, uh, and, and say, Sunero's Clause and all these more recent cases come down to, has this shift to discrimination actually heralded a novel approach? I would say not. I would say the problem that we have, and, and that is uh, I think something very unique about fiscal state aid cases, we don't really have a lot of case law, especially not about this. And the reason why we don't have a lot about this is that most of the cases that I've mentioned before, Pink Raffles, the Noiks, the Adria Bean, these are preliminary references. And when it comes to determining the reference system in a state aid investigation of the commission, Commission must establish the first two steps. Reference system to derogation. But in a national case, it's the national judge that generally has to do that. And that's not what the Court of Justice is doing when these questions are referred to. The court is explained to how they have to do it, not what it is. So we don't really see many direct practical applications, with the exception of Gibraltar and World Be Free. And so my conclusion is that selectivity again comes down to discrimination of comparable situations and whether there's a, just, a justification for that. And I mentioned here um, at the end that uh, there's an interesting question because when we go then, let's say we, we're doing our analysis of whether there's state aid, we have to determine is there discrimination. Right? There's only state aid if there's discrimination because then you have selectivity. Then the question is, is that state aid compatible? <coughs> state aid cannot be compatible if it violates the fundamental principle of non-discrimination. 
Where are we going? What kind of discrimination? What does it mean? And I think the crux of the message that I want to send, and that's why I said beginning no, is how does this play with the fiscal sovereignty of the member states? And I think the most important thing is fiscal sovereignty ends where discrimination begins. None of the decisions we have adopted attack Ireland's 12.5% tax rate, the double Irish, the Dutch sandwich. These things are not looked at. This is fiscal sovereignty matters. That Hungary now has a 9% corporate income tax rate. May be deplorable, may be bad for the European Union as a whole, but that's not a matter of state aid. What is a matter of state aid? A matter of state aid is that a company like Amazon, which happens to belong, not even Amazon, I would say, Amazon's operating company in Luxembourg, which happens to belong to a larger multinational corporate group, can agree with another Amazon company that it will transfer 92% of its profits to that company that has no employees, no board, no functions, does practically nothing but holds entirely passively an IP that it gives to that operating company. Now, a bookstore, when Amazon still needs to sell books, a bookstore here in the Netherlands can't do that. So a bookstore here in the Netherlands pays 25.5% tax on its profits. Amazon's operating company in Luxembourg pays de facto 5%. Is there discrimination? I think there is. So I don't think I have much time to continue, so I will point out some of the interesting cases we have recently. One is here the um, Hungarian and Polish turnover tax cases which are a bit more in the line of the, um, the Gibraltar case law, um, because what we have here is an inherently discriminatory system that is set up in order to basically punish larger undertakings, very often foreign-owned undertakings, and as Poland itself very, very strongly said when it adopted the law in question, to benefit Polish business, small Polish businesses. We looked into it and we say, well, we have here a discrimination that is caused by the way these progressive rates are applied to turnover, which means that larger undertakings are taxed at a higher level than smaller undertakings. Uh, can I quickly do the tax rulings? Or do you want me to stop? Yeah. Quick. 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 Okay. Tax rulings, selectivity. For us, they're individual aid measures granted to a specific company dealing with specific taxation of those companies in the specific situations, individual measure we need to show an advantage. However, what is a test for advantage? According to the Court of Justice in the Form 187 judgment, which deals with the exact same situation as all our tax ruling cases. Form 187 is about determining tax or profits of companies belonging to a multinational group. There it was done through a scheme, through a formula. Here it's done through a tax ruling. There an OECD method was used, the cost plus method. And it was distorted in a way that allowed certain multinationals in Belgium that had a certain number of employees, a certain number of turnover, to pay less tax as we said in the decision, than other multinationals, but also than other standalone companies that pay arms and profits. And the test they said is you need to compare the method, so in our case, the method for determining taxable profit with the ordinary tax system, with the way normal standalone companies, not forming part of a group, are taxed under conditions of free competition, how they're taxed there. That having been said, all of our decisions contain subsidiary lines of reasoning. The first, we first say, we do the three step test, and we say there's a discrimination as compared to standalone companies under the ordinary tax system, and then we look at the case of just companies belonging to a multinational corporate group and the specific provision in national law saying that they need to be taxed at arm's length. We say there's discrimination there as well. And the Apple decision also contains a third finding of selectivity based on the lack of objective criteria. There we ask Ireland, what criteria do you use to determine the taxable profit of non-resident companies offering through branch? And five years later, we still don't know. Again, the benchmark is the treatment of independent standalone companies under the ordinary tax system. Which ordinary tax system? The ordinary tax system of the Netherlands, of Luxembourg, of Belgium, not an EU arms length principle. I hear this over and over again. Here's all conferences. It's not an EU's no arms length principle. But then again, there's no Belgian arms length principle. There's no Latvian you know, arms length principle. There's the arms length principle. It's a principle. Treatment of standalone companies, the treatment of their transactions, how their profit and their transactions are taxed under the ordinary tax system. What's the ordinary tax system? Separate entity approach plus the arms of principle. And the reason why, again, the reference system has to compose both standalone companies and companies belong to multinational groups is that's the purpose of the arms of principle. You need to compare them to standalone companies. That's what the arms of principle is all about. If we were to say the reference system is the 
just companies belong to a multinational company, you can have a measure in a member state that says, we tax companies belong to a multinational corporation at 0%. No state. We're all treated exactly the same, but our standalone companies pay in Belgium 39.99%. So is this all total political crap? I think not. These are our cases. Thank you very much, and sorry for going over time.